Thank you for joining us for the Consultants Training Institute's Conversations with the Masters Series. I'm Brian Jones, and pleased to be joined by Mike Costello. Mike, thanks for joining us. I'm glad to be here, Brian. A pleasure to spend some time with you. And uh, also, thank you for taking this opportunity to share with the profession um, some of your insights into uh, the profession, how you've been involved over the years, and hopefully some tips and strategies on making future analysts successful. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be a part. Thanks. So tell us, um, where did you grow up and uh, your undergraduate work, your schooling, and how you found your way into the profession of valuing business enterprises? I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, which is in southeastern Tennessee, and attended schools there and uh, basically uh, went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville for a year and a half, so became a a huge Vols fan mm -hmm. from that experience and graduated from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga with a bachelor's degree in uh, business administration. Um, I began right after that to work as an accountant in a, uh, a, a credit union and then after that within a few years I found myself working at a CPA firm. Okay. After I'd been with the CPA firm for just a while I uh, started doing uh, basically back then uh, you would have called it forensic accounting. Uh, it wasn't a term that was a term of art at that time, but I was helping people put together por uh, forecasts and projections for uh, business growth and development, primarily for financing. We would help people raise uh, debt and equity financing. And then after that, uh, what happened was I was uh, called by someone who needed a business valuation of a small business in a divorce case. and. You know, I never really heard about business valuation, didn't know that much about it, uh, but I did know that with the, you know, the experience and the skills that I'd developed with the forecasts and projections that I'd been doing, that I should be able to help in that area because what I'd helped a lot of small business people do is purchase a business. Okay. And so I used those same skills in the first case that I did, uh, but then after that, you know, I learned uh, very quickly that I didn't know as much as I'd like to know or need to know about business valuation. So I attended a conference um, that was a uh, AICPA conference on litigation and valuation. And uh, after that, uh, well, well, first of all, at that conference, I was persuaded by Shannon Pratt, who said, you're a CPA. You think you know how to do business valuation. But you know what? You're wrong. <laughs> you don't know, so you need some training. Right. And uh, with that, I uh, embarked upon uh, uh, getting training through the uh, Institute of Business Appraisers mm -hmm. and uh, went through their program and uh, it started uh, getting my interest up and uh, after that uh, I became um, credentialed mm -hmm. in uh, business valuation uh, based on you know that first little divorce case that I worked on. Subsequent to that I worked on a number of divorce cases. Uh, I was hired by the opposing attorney in the first case that I worked on and then when I worked with him I was hired by the opposing attorney in that case so as time went on the local community kind of batted me around like a ping-pong ball mm -hmm. the, the local legal community. But you got some good experience. Got some great, great experience, reports. courtroom experience, uh, t you know expert testimony experience in addition to the uh, evaluation work I was doing so you know that began a new career for me. Mm -hmm. Do you recall who your instructors were when you went through your the CBA course? Yes, uh, it was uh, Gary Trugman and uh, Ray Miles. Oh, wow. Yeah, so those are the... Those are great instructors. They really were. I got the, the um, opportunity to introduce Gary at a, um, at a meeting not long ago, and I talked about how he trained me back when I was a young man. And mm -hmm. He said, well, I wish you hadn't told uh, you know how old <laughs> I am now. I, I said, well, I didn't give the age, but... <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Well, the profession has changed and evolved so rapidly over the past 15, 20 years. I mean, numerous organizations are now offering credentials. Um, there are evaluators and appraisers out there with different levels of experience and, and types of engagements. What do you see right now um, are some of the challenges that you feel the profession is facing? Well, I think um, that there's a number, as you said, a number of uh, people out there, professionals who practice in the valuation area with a number of different uh, credentials and specialties and the like, 
To me, the challenges right now are, uh, you know, the specialization that's needed in this uh, profession because, you know, what we see is there are people who are, uh, have the demand for healthcare evaluation services. So that's an area of its own uh -huh. that uh, attract that uh, someone could go down. Uh, you know, in addition, you've got fair value valuations for financial reporting purposes, and, and that's a, a career track that someone could embark upon right now. Uh, divorce has become a field of its own. Um, so there are just so many different areas that you can go into. You know, personally, I've been a generalist uh, over the years. I've done, you know, valuations and expert testimony for a variety of cases. But I believe one of the challenges right now is, is that you, it's, you just can't be a, a right. generalist and do all those things. Uh, and for example, in, in the firm where I work, we have people who specialize in certain areas, you know, someone in fair value, someone in health care mm -hmm. and the like, because, uh, you know, just one person can't do it all. Right. Well, the, the case law, the methodologies, they're all s getting to the point where they're so um, unique. I mean, there are general business valuation techniques, but for the purposes that you've indicated, there are specific requirements for, for each involved in those reports. That's correct. So you're a litigation person. Primarily, yes. Is that yes, what sir. you enjoy the most, or, or of all the areas you practice, what really gets you going? Yeah, it's the litigation work. Okay. Yes, I do a lot of expert testimony as a financial expert witness, and it's challenging. You mm -hmm. know, it's a very challenging area. The thing, though, that happened to me is that, as I said earlier, uh, as a younger uh, professional, I worked in a lot of cases that required me to go to court and testify. So I focused on that and focused on how to improve my skills in that area. Mm -hmm. And uh, so because of that, you know, I'm called on quite a lot to testify as an expert in court. Uh, nowadays, uh, things have changed. You know, attorneys settle cases more than they used to in the past. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've had this conversation with some of the younger professionals coming along. They just have asked me, how do I get into the courtroom? Because, you know, cases just don't go to court like they used to. Uh, so, um, you know, what I've instructed them to do is maybe try to get into divorce cases because divorce cases are contentious. And, uh, you know, so, you know, a lot of those cases will end up in the courtroom. Now, I don't do as many divorce cases. I've gotten involved more in commercial litigation and that type of thing. So, um, but I do divorce cases from time to time. Just got through uh, testifying in one uh, about this time last year that was a pretty significant case. And, mm -hmm. uh, so that's basically it. So for someone coming into the profession recently credentialed or considering, you know, taking the track down litigation, expert witnessing, what would be some advice you would give to them? Well, first of all, you know, they need to go to a great um, session like um, NACVA gives on expert testimony skills because I think that, you know, it's a unique set of skills that you have to have to get into the courtroom and testify successfully. Uh, you've got to be a good communicator and uh, you, basically that's what the attorneys are looking for because, you know, the judge wants to understand the case, the jury of course wants to understand the case. And uh, so most professionals in, in the world that we live in, you know, the financial world, may be good at crunching the numbers, so to speak, right. but may not be as versed in communicating. So that said, what, what's needed in the expert witness area is the development of good communication skills. I mean, you have to have the basic financial and analytical skills, mm -hmm. but if you don't have the communication skills to go along with it, I don't see how a young person today could be successful. So the the, the key thing for me is once you have the, the basic skills of financial analysis, then you need to develop your communication skills. Mm -hmm. At the conference here in Dallas, you're giving a presentation on ethics and considerations for standards in forensic evaluation services. Um, what are some of the things you're going to be discussing in your presentation? Well, you know, I think that um, ethics and standards are just a huge issue for our profession. And the reason is, is because when you read the newspaper or turn on the news every day, you know, you hear something about some ethical failure that someone has had, and it just takes center stage. The media is so intent on uh, drawing out all the, the worst things that they can find, and, and uh, ethics violations are some of the top ones. I mean, you look at uh, Bernie Madoff, you know, recent case. You look at 
you know, the list goes on and on, you know, WorldCom, Tyco, Adelphia, Enron, I mean, and so, the, and then the, really a, a huge one for our economy has been this, this uh, financial meltdown in the area of real estate, mm -hmm. uh, mortgage financing. So ethics is just, uh, you know, at the top of the list in the public's eye of what they expect people to do. So, you know, and how they expect their people, you know, to perform. And in our world, you know, financial professionals need to have ethical behavior. In addition to that, they need to follow the standards. You know, there's no shortage of standards in our, uh, you know, in this profession. I mean, because you've got basically four major credentialing organizations and associations. And so, you know, with that, each one has their own, uh, you know, professional ethical standards and, and also uh, technical standards that must be followed. To get to some kind of uniformity in, in the valuation uh, and litigation world, you know, you have to be able to, to have some kind of standards that bring this uh, valuation process together to where there's some kind of c comparability. Uh, because, you know, you, you shouldn't have it where uh, just because you've had different training or I've had different training and we both are involved as experts in a lawsuit, you know, it shouldn't be that we come up with wildly different numbers. Right. If you follow the correct uh, standards and ethics, you should come up to something fairly reasonably close. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, and, and then in particular, in the area of um, fair value reporting, uh, fair value uh, valuation for financial reporting, you know, the, the valuations have to be done very consistently because the financial community, you know, investors primarily, are relying on financial statements that include, you know, valuation information now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, business valuation professionals have to give a consistent product to the many companies that have uh, financial reporting needs, or if not, I mean, you're going to have wildly differing um, valuations in financial reporting that's, uh, you know, going to create issues because if one firm does a valuation one year, uh, come up with a number uh, that goes into a financial statement and let's say a different firm does it the next year and they disagree with the way the valuation was done the prior year, so they come up with a different number, you know, you're going to have these swings and, and theoretically, you know, everything should be on a level playing field. Right. Well and the courts and the regulators and the users of those reports are the ones left sort of confused as to, you know, where's the, the cohesion within the profession. Right. So that's, that's the issue. So in my mind, standards and ethics are just a huge issue for the profession. And uh, what I've learned in my experience is that, that a lot of folks just don't really even know what the ethical standards are or what the, the technical standards are. It seems like uh, there's a disregard for standards and ethics in some cases. I mean, I've been involved in a lot of uh, cases in my experience, and so, you know, what you learn is, is that there are some great practitioners out there who are ethical and follow the standards. But what you also learn is that there's some who aren't. And when you see that, you know, I think it's just an unfortunate thing for our profession. People need to be educated, you know, financial uh, valuation professionals need to be educated so that they do a consistent job and uh, and follow the standards and know the standards and know the ethical rules. It seems that most the perception is at least that a lot of evaluators and appraisers you know look at the technical part of what they do um, and not so much the ethical and professional standards issues. They need to be equal. Um, more so, would you? How would you feel about that concept? Oh well, that that's true. You know, you can have the the technical knowledge, and and to do what you know is the proper job, and do the right job. And where a failure comes is, unfortunately, in this profession, you have uh, the attorneys, for example, who will say, "I'm working on this uh, divorce case. I want to hire you to work for the husband." And so we would like a low valuation, of mm. course. Mm -hmm. I'm working for the wife, you know, would like a higher valuation. This valuation is going to go into an estate tax uh, return. It's going to go along with an estate tax return. And so, of course, since it's going to the IRS, we'd like a lower value. Right. Well, you know, what I have told people who uh, say things like that to me is, well, thank you for 
you know, letting me know that that's what you would like. Mm -hmm. But you know, we're going to follow the standards of the profession. We're going to do an ethical job, and we're independent. Mm -hmm. And what that means is, is that we're going to do the proper job on this valuation, just like we do on every one. Mm -hmm. And we'll give you our opinion of value, our conclusion of value, and that will be our opinion or conclusion. You know, yesterday in one of the seminars, I heard an attorney say here that he does uh, uh, tax court cases, and uh, he said what he does is he'll hire a uh, valuation expert and see what number they come up with, and, and if he doesn't like it, he'll find somebody else. Wow. He just said that the reason is is because if he tells someone, you know, we want you to come up with a low value, then there's a struggle throughout the, the, the case, and he has issues, and the valuation professional has issues because, you know, they're, they're trying to work something out which may not be exactly correct. So with that, I just say, well, and, and so what he said is the right thing in my mind, you know, if, if I give you a valuation, a conclusion of value, you don't agree with it, well, then, you know, there's nothing to prevent you from going to another provider of valuation services and having someone else do a valuation, and they may... Uh, you know, um, come up with the same number or close to my range, or they may come up with something entirely different. Right. It's just, you know, it's that's just how it should work. There should should not be pressure on a valuation expert to come up with a, a pre-concluded value. What do you do when you're not working very hard in this profession, your free time and your family? Well, actually, I'm coming up on a week where I'm going to be spending uh, a week with my family at a beach uh, in Florida, uh, I've got two children, two grandchildren, uh, and their spouses, and then uh, my wife's daughter. We're all going together in, in a, a four-bedroom condominium, so we're looking forward to that uh, nice. this week. Uh, my son grew up playing golf. Okay. I, I um, can't say I taught him how to play golf because I was busy quite a lot, didn't get to play as much, although I can play. Okay. So I play golf with him, you know, and we're going to play next week. Uh, but I do. I play golf. I like to snow ski, yeah. and uh, yes, I've been snow skiing the past few years. And and uh, my wife and I enjoy traveling. You know, okay. we travel, you know, really quite a lot, and uh, a lot of it's business related, right. which is great. I mean, we're here in Dallas this week, and she's enjoyed being here and the shopping, and the, oh, yeah. the restaurants are great. So oh, yeah. you know that type of thing. So that's that's generally Where what do you I enjoy do. skiing. Uh, the last few times I've been to Colorado, okay. yeah, Keystone and then Vail the last mm -hmm. time. They're, they're great locations for skiing. Very good. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to give us a little bit more insight from you that will be helpful for those out in the profession looking to make great careers and get good resources to be successful. And for all the contributions you've made, we appreciate it, Mike. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank I've enjoyed so it. Much. Enjoyed our time together.